Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I am Courtney Claypack, uh, the Coral Resilience Postdoctoral Researcher. I am speaking on behalf of Erin Muller, who hopefully is faring the storm well, and also all of our corals up in Sarasota and the Gene Bank, as well as all of our staff up there. So I am going to be attempting to synthesize all of the previous work before my arrival at Moat um, and looking into the complexity of ranking these resilient genotypes within um, a nursery restoration context. Since active reef restoration, we have gotten really good at growing out coral both on land and in, the, and in water and then also out planting on the reefs. And this is thanks to the efforts of probably everyone here at this conference. And we've seen that within that first year where we have more than 95% survival with a crop reserve cornice specifically, and that's very promising news. But what's happening after that first year of survival? At smaller spatial scales with a crop reserve cornice, in this site particularly, we're getting great growth, fusion, and then a return to eco uh, functioning or uh, ecological functioning. But this isn't always the case. A recent study by Van Wosick et al. modeled um, a crop reserve cornice, all outplanting events along the Florida reef tract, and found that after one year up to two and a half years, probability of survival significantly decreases, and it's not restricted to just one site. This is across all restoration sites, all subregions of the Florida reef tract. In addition, where it all looked at the probability of survival as well, looking at a longer term, a longer outlook, and it looks pretty bleak. The probability of survival for a crop reserve cornice gets really low when we look, extend out into multiple years. When we look in that same little window that Van Wosick looked at, we have similar, um, for those in the back, we do have similar declines or similar probabilities of survival within that one to two and a half years. So what's going on? Although we're putting out lots of corals, there's unabated global threats, such as increased frequency and severity of thermal anomalies. We've got decreased pH um, and ocean acidification conditions threatening the structure of reef habitats. And then we have the pervasive and persistent effects of disease, which is affecting all coral reef species within the wider Caribbean. Yet, despite all this, some corals are able to resist stress more than others. And from a restoration context, we want to take and harness these adaptive traits, these resistant traits, and we want to utilize that for um, thoughtful restoration practices. Within Moat's uh, restoration cycle, and this is probably common to other restoration practitioners, the focus is primarily growing up, putting out corals, and harnessing and increasing genetic diversity. But how can we combine both adaptive traits, resistant traits, with increasing genetic diversity? It's, it's complicated. It's tough. Um, but this tiny little box within the restoration cycle is where resilience or resistance training can come into play. So we can look at these big, large global threats as well as focus on smaller local direct effects. At Moat Marine Laboratory, and this is before my time, for the past seven years, they have been basically examining through experimentation, genotype and phenotype responses of their nursery coral species using multiple genotypes um, within their, and testing the response within the facility. The traditional long-term exposure had been utilized to, um, to look at these five main, nor main coral nursery species where five replicate ramets were exposed to each treatment. We did four factorial treatments of control, and we did ocean acidification or high PCO2, ocean warming, high temperature, and then the combined end of century predictions for ocean warming and acidification. One week of ramp up to temperature or ramp down in pH, followed by eight weeks at that exposure treatment. At zero, four, and eight weeks, we took non-destructive measures of coral growth measured various ways, as well as photophysiology measured various ways. The end of the experiments, we did destructive measures of symbiotic density, chlorophyll concentration, host protein, immune responses. So in these past seven years, what have we learned? First, we've learned that stressors are often synergistic. So in this panel on the left, this is looking at growth for buoyant weight for a crop reserve cornice, 12 genotypes examined in 2016. We see a similar decrease in growth under the independent ocean acidification and ocean warming conditions, but a much larger concerted reduced growth under both of those stressors together. 
In addition, and similarly, bleaching susceptibility measured through total chlorophyll, we saw almost a negligible effect of OA. We saw a strong reduction or a strong bleaching uh, response under temperatures and then a much greater response when we look at combined stressors. Next, when we look at these traits for resistance or resistance traits, they often appear independent when you're looking at each one independently or in singular. In this heat plot um, of Orbicella fabulata exposed to end of century conditions, a resistant trait is going to be one that's colored in yellow, or if you, this trait is less resistant, it's going to be a darker color. And when we look at these five genotypes of Orbicella fabulata that are blocked out, you can see that it's not always consistent. If you are resistant or you have a, a more resistant score for your weight, you might not necessarily have the same resistant score for your photophysiology under stress. These corals were also exposed to stony coral tissue loss disease, and we see a similar disconnect when we look at disease resistance, where not the same genotypes are going to be disease resistant, grow well, or respond to heat stress with their photophysiology. So our goal is not to just find the responses, but look for winners and losers. And throughout this panel, it's difficult to tease apart the potential winners, yet we are able to find three potential, she did losers. Um, she did, there, we found three potential losers that have a concerted lower resistance score, lower resistant trait across the board. In addition to these traits, you can measure these traits in a variety of ways. So how you measure that phenotype, let's say the bleaching phenotype, can be measured through FE over FM, chlorophyll, RGB analysis. There's various ways. That can also differ depending on the experiment and the coral's response. So this was a study with three genotypes of pseudodeploria clivosa. Let's focus on ocean acidification, where basically the ranking values for the three genotypes is going to be different when we look at FV over FM versus when we look at chlorophyll. Moreover, when we incorporate and look at high temperature or ocean warming, we find kind of like a winning and a losing genotype based on their FV over FM values, but that doesn't always translate into the same pattern or that same ranking when we're looking at chlorophyll. In addition, that type of experiment matters. So previously, all Moat has um, worked with has been these like long-term eight-week-long um, eight exposures. With my arrival, I brought in the Acute Coral Bleaching Automated Stress System, or CBAS, because I was like, you guys have hundreds of genotypes. We don't have the time. We don't have the energy to stress test only 10 to 15 genotypes at a time. We can rapidly assess our nursery genets using a CBAS approach. And that's what the CBAS looks like. It's very transportable and you can do various temperature stresses, three hour increase, three hour hold, one hour decrease, and then recovery overnight. And what we find when we compare our experiments with the response of FE over FM, we find that there is actually a strong overlap. About 70% of the 10 genotypes tested had similar FE over FM responses with respect to experiment. And we only found three genets that differed in their FE over FM response in respect to experiment type. Now we've looked at various types of traits. We commonly are looking at now multiple stressors. So what are their potential trade-offs in all of these traits in our corals that we're ex um, experimenting on? So within the combined end of century context, this is an, uh, basically an association plot where we have all of the traits measured within the combined ocean warming and acidification treatment. X's represent non-significant, Darker colors rec represent a positive association, and red represents a negative association. And what we can see is that in all of these traits that we measured, we found very few negative associations or potential trade-offs within this combined treatment. And we find more positively associations um, under our traits. Now, when we can kind of flip this on its head and look at each trait, um, we can look at all the treatments within each trait. We also find positive associations of the bleaching response, such as chlorophyll, when we compare all of our four treatments to one another. And then similar pattern when we look at, again, all of the traits, we do find that traits of genotypes do respond similarly under these different environmental treatments. Lastly, work by uh, recent work by Klingis et al. She is kind of our geneticist, disease microbiologist. She's done some experiments where we have two genets of Acropora cervicornis that have a different microbial consortium that are, dis that are disease resistant. So we were wondering, does this translate, if disease resistant, if you're disease resistant, does this translate into potential loss of fecundity?
Dr. Hannah Cook is um, in prep of putting this publication out, where when we look at those two disease-resistant um, genotypes, we see that there is no apparent trade-off in fecundity, especially when we look at the x-axis here as mean total eggs per bundle. And so these are the two resistant genotypes. They still have a high number of total eggs per bundle. Um, only one of them has kind of a lower sperm count per bundle. We have found some small instances of potential trade-offs, and I think this just depends on which species you're looking at. And it also depends on what you're measuring. So again, within the three um, genotypes of Pseudodeploria clivosa, we did find this inverse relationship between growth and bleaching susceptibility. But when we look at light calcification instead of growth rate, that potential trade-off is lost. But again, let's return back to the whole of determining who's doing better or worse than others. And you can see that these red colors are a higher score, a higher uh, z-score, and then the blue is a lower z-score. So again, we can actually kind of suss out when we are working with smaller genets, smaller number of genets, who the winner and who the loser might be. So everything that I've told you, it seems to be really complicated, right? And I think that collectively, all of this work that we've been doing with our genets of our five nursery species, all of our responses seem to be species specific, not really a huge surprise. So why bother doing all of this work that we've been doing? And why not bank on genetic diversity, which is kind of the original crux of restoration was just let's enhance genetic diversity. So let's go back to that very first figure that I showed you. If we do not thoughtfully incorporate into integrating resiliency or res uh, re resistant traits in our coral species, genotypes, or populations, then this is what we're going to see in the long term. Again, this is cervicornis. And these stressors, they're not going away. I mean, as we've seen this week, the stressors are only increasing frequency, severity. So we do need a plan for the future. So to summarize all of the work that has been happening, we do want to continue examining these threats in concert. These major threats are going to have synergistic or probably additive effects as well. And then resistance to one threat does not necessarily equate to a resistance for another threat. Those losers might be more uh, readily easy to identify than the winners, which actually is probably good for maintaining genetic diversity, increasing genetic diversity, because we're not solely focused on let's keep that top performer, let's keep that top 10% of our genets that are doing the best. It's great to maintain genetic diversity, and so maybe we can just slowly figure out how to call out the losers, per se. As a community, I think, and Carla mentioned this yesterday, it's the biggest challenge is like finding these traits that are most informative and then also making them consistent in their methodology and then in their reporting. But then I think also, too, where especially a talk I was just at, I think it's good to look at multiple traits from a holistic approach and then see if those traits are heritable or plastic or adaptive. And I think that's the strongest point of moving forward working with these restoration corals. Trade-offs can exist, but the evidence is relatively limited, and I think it's probably specific to certain coral species. And lastly, I think just overall integrating these resistant traits in the, in the context of active ecological restoration is going to be our best chance to restore resilient reefs in the long term. There are lots of people that have done this work, and there's lots of funding sources, and thank you very much. We do have time for a question, if anyone has a burning question. I would like to ask you a question yeah. before anyone else gets the chance to put their hand up. So one of the key messages that I'm getting here, and I've seen it at other presentations as well, is obviously what you measure really carries huge implications into your decision making and kind of what it means. Absolutely. Where are we at in terms of informing, guiding what is being measured relative to outcomes and goals of different restoration programs? Is that something that is emerging? Is that something as a community we should start thinking about? Sure. I mean, is there a workshop for that? <laughs> I think that'd be Let's like, talk. I think that'd be really awesome, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many things that we can measure. There's so many traits to measure. And then, like, when I think about bleaching susceptibility with just in that, that small, many faceted approach, it's like the responses, I think, are also related to the cell biology and the timing of mm -hmm. a stress response. So I think it's still good to you. And I think it depends on the practitioner itself. So, like, not a plug, but we're giving a workshop next week, and we're going to be having participants that have low resources versus high resources. So I think it also just depends on your capacity to measure something. So sometimes simple as just survival or the color card, if you can make that a, qu a quantitative measure, 
then that would be really informative. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't know if there is a consensus yet. Mm -hmm. I know that everybody seems to have like their favorite flavors of things. Um, but it's something worth looking into. And I think just, I think also not focusing just on the symbiont, but also the coral host, and then looking at the other participants mm -hmm. in that hollow bion as well. Not really. Talk more about that, even. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you Thanks. very much. We'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you.